Hello, everybody. This is Joseph P. Farrell, and we are back, as you can see. Uh, this is the weekend of March 25th, and I'm actually doing this once again on a Thursday night because I know from judging all of the uh, comments I've been getting that uh, people missed the fireside chats last week and are really looking forward to this one, so I thought I'd give everybody a, a break and uh, get back on the fireside chats for this week a little early and uh, again I may be um, doing some more as the weekend goes on but as you can see from behind me I have changed things around quite a deal uh, I'm hoping that this will give us a little bit more flexibility in, in doing our fireside chats I'm uh, in the process of finishing up my business trip that I was uh, on before so anyway we're back <laughs> so what I want to do is uh, address some things that I've been noticing in the comments and the comments have been running pretty much uh, all over the board but there's one in particular about Japan that I thought uh, was very interesting should be addressed and that is there are so many anomalies it, be it, it seems to be coming out now about this earthquake and the first problem that we have is that I am not completely convinced that what this earthquake was was a manifestation of a technology. I'll be very blunt and honest. After all, Japan is in an earthquake zone. This is well known. It, it has had throughout its history a number of very devastating earthquakes and this one certainly no exception. What I think we have to do is hold open the possibility that it may have been the result of a technology. I'm certainly willing to be open to that possibility. There are a number of people already speculating that harp-like technologies have had something to do with it. The problem is that one would have to coordinate a very careful data search of earthquake activity and ESCAT in Europe and then HARP of course in, in Alaska to see if they were actually on or uh, functioning during significant earthquakes. So I think we're a long way from making the case that this may have been something artificial. But let's leave all that aside what has disturbed me throughout this whole earthquake tragedy and then the resulting uh, nuclear power plant failure is if we stop and look at the most basic anomaly of them all that would appear to be not only the nuclear power plant but the placement of this nuclear power plant as far as I've been able to tell in, in the short amount of time that I've had to research this problem, being on the road and, and rearranging everything here at the Nefarium, uh, the problem is that why would you build a nuclear reactor, in fact four of them, close to the sea with a mere 25 foot seawall in a country that is number one earthquake prone and number two has a history of devastating tsunamis. Why would you do that? This to me constitutes one of the big unanswered questions. Why was it not placed further inland somewhere for one thing where it would not have been susceptible to a tsunami? All right, This, this is a problem I think we really have to ask and question. The second anomaly that really bothers me as I'm watching on television and trying to get a handle on this situation, the second problem is that we're looking at a very sophisticated country that's been hit by a devastating earthquake and there's two things here that really upset me. It's been a while for the Japanese government to give us a coherent consistent story particularly about the nuclear fuel rod problem that they've been having and it's so conflicting at times that it's very very hard to get some sort of picture on what's happening. I, I've been watching television news and even the experts seem to be a bit flummoxed so this is the other problem that we're faced with. It's, it's difficult to get accurate readings uh, from the Japanese government, from the experts, or at least it has been. It seems to be kind of resolving itself right now. But that raises my other problem. The Japanese government is 
is obviously a sophisticated country. It's, it's technologically advanced, as, as advanced as the United States, uh, any of the European countries, and so on. So the response of the Japanese government to this, to me, seems very, very anomalous. And I don't know if any of you have noticed this as well. But I'm having a deep, deep problem with the way that this has been handled and all of the conflicting stories. In fact, I forget what channel I was watching, but uh, I saw on television one of the experts, as this nuclear crisis was beginning to unfold, and I was on the road and, and uh, got a motel room and tuned in, and I forget what channel it was that I was tuning into, but the expert ultimately just kind of threw up his hands and says, well, we don't really know. Uh, you know, and that's not a good position to be in when you're having nuclear reactors melt down on you and <laughs> spewing forth all this radioactivity. So I think there's something fishy here. I, I even though I grant the proposition that that the case for a technology driven artificially induced earthquake has yet to be made and it seems to me that we are looking at something natural, at least perhaps something natural that may have been exacerbated by the response of the Japanese government. It, it's very fishy to me, the placement of this and the Japanese government's reaction to all of this. It's very, very fishy. And there's one final point that uh, I noticed that is, as I've been trying to dig around and, and fish around for uh, answers to this earthquake, there's another problem that, that really struck me that might be something that could possibly, and please underline and boldface and italicize the word possibly here, because I found something by way of trying to figure out whether this earthquake was genuinely a natural disaster or if it might have been artificially driven. And as far as I can tell now, the earthquake itself, the tsunami, tsunami was generated from a point where there is no major fault. In other words, the, the plate tectonics, the earthquake occurred on the plate itself, not on a fault line where, where you would normally expect an earthquake to occur. It was off-center, so to speak. Now, that might possibly, again, underline possibly, boldface it, italicize it, that might possibly argue that what we're looking at is an artificially induced phenomenon. The problem here is if we start down that path of arguing that way about it, and I'm open to it, everybody who knows me knows, <laughs> knows that I'm fairly open to that possibility, but once we start down there, what we're really what we're really saying too is something very major and I hope everyone pays attention to it because that would mean that whoever would be controlling that technology not only has invested a great deal amount of time into discovering the actual technology to make that sort of thing happen but they've also done something else very significant and that is they've invested a great deal of time in exploring aspects of geophysics that may not be too well known publicly because again this earthquake is is very peculiar in the sense that it appears as far as what information i've been able to gather and it may be it may be inaccurate information because of all the wild inaccuracies and conflicting stories that we've had thus far but if it's true that this did occur at a place where there's no fault line, then, then we're looking at some sophisticated tinkering on a geophysical level if, if it was indeed an artificially adu induced quake. So all these thoughts have been going through my mind. I'm sure that some of you have been having similar thoughts about this earthquake. And uh, I'd like to hear you know your thoughts about what you think right now because as the story unfolds, my own reaction to it, my own position, keeps kind of sliding and shifting. I really don't know yet what to make of it, and I suspect that there's a lot of you out there that way as well. Now, let's finish up this uh, news and views from the Nefarium with a couple little items. Um, I was just informed from Adam Parfrey at Feral House that Jeans, Giants, Monsters, and Men is out. They're supposed to be sending me my copies. Now, I don't know 
if they have actually sent the copies to the distributors and if they're actually on the I suspect that they have so that means if you've ordered off my website or Amazon or through Barnes and Noble or somebody like that that means you're gonna have a lag time from about now to say three or four weeks while it works its way through the distributors and then on into the stores so uh, it's still gonna be a while yet but I, I'd appreciate hearing from any of you that have ordered the book so that we can find out uh, exactly where you're at in terms of, of getting the books uh, that you've pre-ordered and so on. But uh, that was the first announcement. Uh, the second announcement that I have is that uh, my friend and I are finishing up the book that we're working on. Um, and that should be, I think, give me till the end of April. I think maybe that I'll have that one done. That's, of course, Grid of the Gods. Uh, that book is a bit different from what you might expect from the title. This is not a work like Carl Monk that's going to go into lots of mathematical details about the placement of these things. I'm focusing on a few certain sites and a few cultures and the cosmologies and uh, kind of what I call paleophysical thinking that are involved with respect to some of these sites. There will be a couple of major technical chapters in it at the very beginning to set up a very interesting historical problem related, I think, to the world grid. But I, I again, emphasize I'm only making a speculative case uh, with that problem. But I did point out a, a major historical problem. And uh, you'll have to wait for the book to find out what that is. And then at the end, there's going to be another uh, major technical chapter. And I've already started another book. Uh, after Grid of the Gods, so I can't tell you what that's about, uh, but that book is uh, going to be kind of kind of a new thing for me, uh, a subject matter I've not dealt with too extensively before, so that's uh, all the hint I can give you. Anyway, this has been Joseph P. Farrell with News and Views from the Nefarium for the weekend of March 25th. I may be back this weekend. I may not be back this weekend, but I thank you all. Uh, so very much uh, for your support and your comments and uh, for those of you who've made donations. We're still getting the website up and running and it's, I, I do appreciate your patience with that. It's a lot of work uh, for Daniel and it's certainly a lot of work for me. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's literally changed my life. So uh, I thank you all for sticking with us and we'll see you on the flip side. Bye bye everybody.